Hello. <laughs> I'm glad I'm going first. I'm, I, I'm not a difficult act to follow, right? So, oh, let me get organized. Um, you know, I, oh, I'm sorry. You know, I'll, right from the get-go, I start saying, um, before I say anything else. And I'm sorry, I'm going to do my best I'm, to avoid that. <laughs> um, there I go. <laughs> Yikes. Well, let me turn this on. I'm going to start by showing a few, um, just three drawings that I made here at Brown. I thought it would be fun to um, revisit that. For, um, it was a little bit for me. Um, I've, I found these uh, uh, in my, um, in storage. And this, is, this piece is a self-portrait that I did. Um, I was studying with Hugh Townley, um, who was a great mentor. And uh, it's three feet by three feet. And it's a self-portrait um, that I did in uh, Sumi ink and uh, with a stick. And this one uh, is 40 inches tall and 20 inches wide. And it's um, a dressed form um, in reflect, with a reflection of it in the mirror. Uh, and then this one is a um, this one is three feet by three feet, and uh, this is uh, a plastic bag full of oranges. So, anyway, I I just wanted to start with those three brown things. It was sort of fun for me to see them again. But let me move up closer to the present. A couple of years ago, I started. Um, I, actually, I've I've been active in this practice for many years, but I just sort of revived it again recently over the past couple of years. Um, they, I call them travel drawings. Basically, they're sketchbooks, um, and I, they start with my um, cutting a small piece of paper and folding it up and putting it in my handbag or my pocket, and they're just things that I travel with and I draw when I'm in transit. I happened to be in, uh, living in Los Angeles at the time for five months, and uh, I was um, flying back to New York and I really needed s some kind of thing to bring with me so I quickly folded up a piece of paper and, uh, and, I, and I started at the airport. Uh, you can see the wing of the plane on the left and then over here uh, is a, a skylight that ended up on the bottom and then this kind of you know, very banal uh, kind of geometry of the, uh, of the airport shops and then the stuff on the right is basically the detritus that I find just in my travels, uh, things that I pick up off the street that I think are pretty. And um, coins. You know, sometimes the beautiful things that I find are things that m maybe a lot of people see as trash, but you, you probably all have that experience too. This is actually much more recent. This I finished just a couple of weeks ago. And this is... Um, a, more ephemera that I find just walking down the street. Somehow I'm really fascinated by laundry, by dry cleaning tickets and, um, uh, and parking lot tickets that are sort of done in this, um, what now feels a little old fashioned, a kind of offset lithographic kind of printing that I just find really beautiful and, um, and kind of nostalgic. I guess nostalgia is kind of a naughty word, but it's, uh, but I, I think there probably is a lot of that in my work, in a way, um, <laughs> as sort of reflecting on things that are past. Um, and then this is another one um, that is, again, the same ephemera. Um, this is ac an actual photograph of the kind of ephemera that I find. And I was walking down the street in Queens, and there was, uh, I passed this wrapper, and I walked by it. And then it's like, oh, i got to go back and pick that up. And um, so uh, I just loved it. I never heard of sky flakes before. And a as you can see, it's a kind of saltine-style cracker. And I just loved the wrapper. Um, I really needed to turn around and go pick it up. And then I um, started to do a drawing of it. Um, I was just saying to Paul and Carrie today over lunch that uh, as I grow older, I'm making my drawings seem to be getting larger. The images in the drawings get larger, and I think it's because I can't, because my vision is getting much worse. Um, and um, so, anyway, uh, what was I going to say about this? I forget. It'll come to me. Oh, it's actually not very big. Um, it's probably, uh, oh, I don't know, about two feet tall. But it's a lot bigger than the wrapper. 
And this is just my bathroom door where I just have a lot of stuff just kind of in progress. I work in my studio, but I also work um, in, my, um, in my kitchen and at home. Um, as you'll see over the course of you know, the images, um, sometimes I work from the movies and sometimes I work directly from life, from the objects of my life. Um, the, um, the funny thing about finding, you know, I'd never heard of Sky Flakes before I found that rapper in the street and then the other day I was walking down the street in Greenpoint just a couple of blocks away from my house and there in the trash was this Sky Flakes box and I just was like, wow, it's, I mean, it's interesting because it's maybe something I would have passed by ordinarily um, if I hadn't made a drawing of it, but, um, and that gets me a little bit into sort of maybe starting to talk about why drawing for me. Um, drawing to me is very connected to writing and thinking and studying. And I feel that, you know, because like in a way that sky wrapper wrapper is actually maybe in some ways more beautiful than the drawing I made of it. But somehow it's, you know, why don't I just stick that up on the wall and show that? But, you know, because it's such a great thing all by itself. But for me, the process of making of making physical my vision um, is really important in terms of not just seeing something but also knowing something the way that botanical science you know the way that a scientist might do a drawing of a botan of a um, of a botanical drawing of a flower anyway I, I've got to I've got to go faster because I'm um, <laughs> I'm going to show a lot of images and some of them I'm not going to talk too much about I, I am going to sort of talk as fast as I can though um, this piece when I was at Brown, I was doing art and semiotics and we watched a lot of movies and we had to write about them. But back in the years when I was at Brown, um, they were projected as celluloid, you know, sort of movies, not um, with, the ch with the chatter of the projector going and um, there was no rewinding and there was no looking at videos or, and the DVDs didn't exist. And so we would just be writing like mad in the dark um, because we had to write about them. So um, I got pretty good at transcribing dialogue and making notes of, um, of images um, um, over a couple of viewings so that I was able to write about them. But that practice just of note taking um, became a really important part of, um, of my work to this day. Um, after graduate school, in about 1995, I made this, I started this drawing, um, which is, it's hard to tell, but it's ten, it's ten feet around. And it started as a small rectangular piece of paper just in the middle there, you sort of see where the cross is. And I had a whole, I had a whole bunch of those drawings that were, um, that just sort of I was doing drawings of figure of female figures from melodramatic films and soap operas and I was really interested in the way they were represented and the things that they said and they kind of weren't going anywhere and so I thought well what if I add on to this and I and I decided to turn it into an oval instead of turn instead of letting it be a square and then that sort of facilitated a kind of spiral approach and so over the course of time um, it grew to whoop, to look like that it's ballpoint pen on paper, and um, I just kept adding on and gluing together more paper as I went. This piece is much smaller. It's 18 by 24 inches. You can see the, fr I think you can see on one of the edges, the fringe of paper. Maybe it's not in this one. This is called Bad Blood, and it's mostly, um, it's mostly imagery from the soap opera The Bad and the Beautiful. And uh, I was, again, I was interested in women and the things that they said. The thing that interested me very much about the, um, the dialogue in uh, these melodramatic texts, actually in films, I shouldn't just say women's pictures, but men's pictures as well, is that they, um, is that the language seems, when we revisit it and we transcribe it, the language seems very exaggerated and maybe some people might even describe it as being kind of campy. And I think I used to view it that way too, but uh, ultimately, you know, eventually I started to become very interested that it, it really was sort of this 
um, kind of making exterior this, these internalized, deeply emotional uh, feelings. And uh, that really interests me about the text in movies. Um, it appears to be real, and when we're watching it, we might you know, choose to accept it, and it may, the language might become, in a way, kind of natural as we're watching it. But when you revisit it and you, and you read transcripts, it's just really crazy, crazy talk. And here um, is um, a version that I did of men, of, from men's movies and the things that they said and the ways that men's films are ornamented. And this is ballpoint pen on paper, and this is about um, 20 inches square. And so um, uh, it's mostly from westerns and science fiction pictures and film noir and uh, uh, crime films. Um, here is sort of a Spielberger of a bridge. Um, and uh, this was sort of the ornamentation that I became interested in from watching these movies. The language was just as exaggerated, but it was very macho and very aggressive. Um, the pen octopon at the top on the upper left is sort of um, like the, from a prison picture. Um, here is the bell buckle of shame. And uh, here is a, sort of a hallway from a science fiction movie and the back, the back lights up from Alan Delon's car from a Melville film. So there's all kinds of stuff in this drawing that have to do with this kind of Hollywood representation of men's worlds. After I, I did a whole bunch of drawings like that that dealt with the figure, um, and, um, and at a certain point I thought, you know, I'm not dealing with the space of melodrama in a way. And so I was, um, I, Actually, I remember watching My Three Sons. It was on every day at noon, and I used to just sort of watch it every day, just for like, an, I'd watch two episodes a day. And I noticed that almost all the action happened in the foyer, the kitchen, and the living room, sometimes in Chip's bedroom. And <laughs> so I, so then I was watching this Robert Aldrich picture called The Big Knife from the 1950s. And it's set in this, I thought it was shot on location because this set is so, damn spectacular um, and so believable. Um, but it's a set, um, but it's a very complete, you know, sort of uh, representation of a Bel Air man movie star mansion. Um, and uh, so I thought, what happens if I take all the different views of that interior, take out all the characters, and I just, you know, basically kind of stitch them all together through drawing and see if I can, you know, um, create a kind of seamless space through drawing. And in this one also, I did a very similar thing. This is about, oh, that last one is about 20, that last one was about 20 feet wide, and this one is about, I don't know, it's probably about 15 feet wide, it's a little smaller, maybe a foot and a half tall. And it's ballpoint on paper, and this, and what I do is I freeze frame, and I make a log of all the different shots that I want to stitch back together. And uh, this is a, a Connecticut living room from the film Dangerous from the 1930s. Um, Connecticut as a text, you know, sort of um, the way that Hollywood represents uh, Connecticut or and many other kinds of states and cities and places is, was really interesting to me. I remember taking Michael Silverman's cla a class that Michael Silverman taught once that was called um, Berlin Alexanderplatz and Texts of Berlin, and it was basically all uh, it was a wonderful course of films that were shot on location in Berlin, and every week we would see a different installment of Berlin Alexanderplatz as well. And so, by Fassbinder. So anyway, I, when I was watching these, I started noticing these Connecticut films. Connecticut is, is near New York, but it's not New York. It is New England, and so it's, and it sort of is the country, and um, the interiors, you know, depending on what year, the f decade the film was made, they're all kind of, you know, contemporary, but they're peppered with antiques. There's almost always a fireplace. People go there, like, to be artists, you know, or maybe they go away to have some quiet when they're writing, or they go away to have an illicit affair. So <laughs> Connecticut, just as a text, I mean, just as a place, became interesting to me. This film happens to star Betty Davis, but I'm not interested in that it's Betty Davis's house. I'm interested that it is this fictional place. And the, the same with this drawing that um, is in the gallery right now. This is, um, from the, this is a drawing that I did from the movie called My Reputation. And in this movie, um, this is a drawing of the bedroom of the main character named Mrs. Jessica Drummond. I'll come back to this drawing a little bit later. This is another drawing that I did also in ballpoint pen, and this is about 18 feet wide. And uh, 
You can see that the sort of eccentric shape of this drawing, um, basically the shape of my drawings is dictated by the images that are in it. So, for instance, on the right-hand side, actually, this, just to back up a little bit, this is a, um, an image of two adjoining bedrooms. They're adjoined by a closet in between. The man's room is on the right and the woman's room is on the left. The, woman, the female character's name is Myra Hudson. It's from a film called Sun Here. And here on the right is the man's room. You can really tell this is a woman's picture in a way because this woman's room is so developed. And then this man's room is very stark. And then there's this closet in between and then there's uh, Myra Hudson's room. And, uh, but when I, when I, I think I started it on his side, and you can see that I kind of was doing okay, and it was just sort of going along, and it wasn't getting, you know, it's like everything fit within the frame that I established. I had to add on some paper here. And then all of a sudden, it sort of, the camera went down to the floor, and I, or maybe the camera got a little bit closer to that wall, and I could see some of the ceiling, so I really needed to add on some paper. And of course, when it turned the corner, it came around Myra Hudson's, uh, Myra Hudson's desk and needed to take yet another jog. So this is, I mean, you can't really tell anything about the drawing, much about the drawings. This really is just me showing you how big some of my drawings get sometimes. This piece is 10 feet tall. The piece on the left is 10 feet tall and 45 feet wide. And this is an installation at the Saatchi Gallery in London. And this is the piece um, that you just saw on the left. Um, it's my heart, my work is very difficult to, um, um, to document. Um, it's, uh, it's hard to convey the feeling um, of this um, of work that goes outside of your peripheral vision. So um, anyway, um, I s this drawing is sort of wild. It's a sumi ink drawing. I did a sumi ink and brush instead of the ballpoint pen. Um, it was a pretty big brush, like a very big moth number 12 uh, watercolor brush. I started up here on the left. And I was moving across, and uh, I got to the stairs, and I thought, oh, shoot, um, it's not going to fit. But, so I tried to fake it, and I really tried to cheat, and I made a little staircase. And I thought, OK, I just, but it really looked stupid. So I ended up um, just sort of letting these things, letting the stairs go down. It's like, all right, let's go. So I went down, and then as I was going down, uh, I got to the doorway, and the this particular drawing, I wanted it, I'm showing it at a space in San Francisco called New Langton Arts, and it's from the movie Sudden Fear, and Myra Hudson is a playwright who also is an heiress, and she starts out in a Broadway theater on the, in the east, on the right, and then she gets on the train and travels to her home in San Francisco on the west, on the left. But I started with the uh, library, and then I moved rightward. And then when I got to the train, I kind of freaked out because I thought I was excited to do a drawing with the train, but because I remember it so vividly, it was such a great train ride, you know, and it's such an important part in the movie. And then I got to the train, and those two characters <coughs> were in the way the whole time. They were mostly shot in close up in compartments. And there were very few details of the interior. So I thought, well, all right, I'll just draw what I see. I think this is going to be a disaster. But it actually was, I'm, I'm glad I went forward because it really taught me something about how something, nothing can also indicate a passage of time and space. Time is kind of, you see there's that staircase? I don't know if you can see it. But yeah, there's, like, there's a little staircase under there. No, like <laughs> um, this is done with, again, with straight black ink and um, with no water and no white. And so I use the full, um, um, I use the brush for everything that it will, and the ink for everything it will give me. Um, so it, it's very black when I first dip it. And then when it starts to run out of ink, then I can uh, use it to sort of like rub in the grays. Here's the train. You know, like it's a really great shot out on the platform at when they get to Buffalo, and you can see the little flowers on the table, and, but then it's like they're sitting there and they were totally in the way. <laughs> so, and this is another big drawing, 33 feet wide. It's uh, from a movie called The Night to Remember that is um, a movie about, it's the Titanic story. So. 
Anyway, I'm going to sort of, you get the gist of it, so I'm just going to show you some pictures now, um, at least until we get to the next thing. This is a move from a movie called East Side, West Side, that's a, a Manhattan apartment that's up in the 80s. I loved that about it because the, the, someone really did some pretty good research, and you can see the East River and the, and the East River Drive um, out the window. That's it in my studio, just to give you some sense of its size. Again, Sumi Ink and Brush. And this is from a movie called Possessed from the 1940s. Um, it's a bedroom. I do want to just go back to this for a second. I'm sorry, I, I've really got to be mindful of time. Um, the, uh, when I work from the movies, or when you work from a photograph, all the information is there and you're not going to get any more. You can try to go in closer, but basically, when a shadow is black, it's black. You know, I can't see what's in that shadow. And so, in a funny way, sometimes when I'm working from the movies, especially if I'm sort of advancing the frames as I go, sometimes I'm actually just drawing shapes and I haven't a clue what it is that I'm drawing. And sometimes I realize what I'm drawing only after it's been drawn. Like that chair over on the right, I really didn't know what that was until it was drawn. I, I, know, that, I know that doesn't sound believable, but it's true. Um, and uh, the blacks, the, it, it really is just sort of a jigsaw of shapes. And I do little drawings too. This is a ballpoint pen drawing that's only about 10 inches square. It's, uh, I did the series of drawings of women who I consider in a state of eclipse where they're backlit and we're just seeing them in their faces in silhouette. This is a woman named Aura from a movie called The Witch, an Italian movie from the 60s. This is uh, Mrs. Ann Sutton from Otto Preminger's um, uh, Whirlpool, and uh, that's another drawing of Aura from The Witch. You can see the marks of the ballpoint pen are, are kind of intense. And uh, this is Vittoria from a movie called Eclipse by um, Antonioni. And uh, sh actually, this is a this is this actually is a um, is a paper piece that I did at the paper mill um, called Giudone in New York City. Um, that is a um, it's actually a, a portrait of a of a woman I know named Martina Batan. And it was made in an edition of 25. So that's another one. And that's my process. It just sort of, I just sort of crawl and it just kind of spreads. So let me get to Mrs. Jessica Drummond. Since that's here, I might oh, be interesting for you to, uh, I wonder what happened. Okay. <laughs> um, so this piece, like uh, that sudden fear piece that I told you about that grew, this one was a real monster for me because I started it in ballpoint pen and I finished it in ballpoint pen. This is about, well, you know, it's about 20 feet wide and it's about 8 feet tall. But over here, I, again, silly me, I thought the drawing was going to be that big. But um, what happened is that even though it was a beautiful kind of tracking panoramic shot of the room, it really wasn't a panoramic. It wasn't a. It wasn't. It wasn't a pivot. It was like the maid comes in the room and we see the wall, but then the camera like tracks into Barbara Stanwyck in bed, and her head is as big as the whole back wall. You know. So once I drew her that big, then everything else had to be big too in order for the scale to work and uh, for anything to make sense. And so there you go. It, uh, I never would have chosen to do this in, in ballpoint pen if I had, if I had thought about that. I would have done it in Sumi Ink. Because those Sumi Ink drawings, I mean, I feel like I'm on a rocket ship when I, when I draw in Sumi Ink because it's so fluid. And these are just extremely labor intensive. This, over the, this I worked on over the course of a year. And in the movie, Barbara Stanwyck, Mrs. Jessica Drummond, is in bed. She stands up and she walks across the room to wash her face in the bathroom sink. And there's the bathroom sink, and you can see what isn't there is what I couldn't see because Barbara Stanwyck was there. Okay. So, this was a, I had this closet because, you know, when you're working, for, I work from a movie, it's not just one shot. I'm taking a whole bunch of different shots from the, all over the film, and I bring them back together to try to recreate a sense of wholeness. I first started the drawing with this open closet shot, 
you know. And I, uh, I didn't. I ended up not really liking it because it just didn't work. Just it, the drawing got really huge, and also I really wanted to include that breakfast tray. So I got a, um, a shot of that from another part of the film. And so I was. I ended. This was just. This was a discard. And so I thought, well, shoot, this would be a really nice drawing too. So I. Um, so I made. The, so I. I worked on this and made this into a second drawing from that movie. And then again, here above her head, there was wallpaper. There's this wallpaper that you can sort of see some traces back here. And it was all up there. And uh, by the time the drawing was finished, it really looked bad. Um, it looked um, so I cut it out and uh, paste, I just pasted in some white paper. And, uh, but then I had this cutout that I kind of liked, so I decided to do it again. You can see the, see the little piece I cut out right at the, at the very top over the bed. I, want, I, I was dying to see what it would look like, so I did it again. Um, and this movie just keeps giving and giving because that house set, it's a, like a house that's set, um, it's supposed to be in Lake Forest on the North Shore of Chicago. It's just a great set that just, you feel like you're in a real house. And it's so fake. These are my working notes. And this is um, my, uh, my kitchen. Now, I am going to race because I have like five minutes left. <laughs> but these I do from life. Um, my pictures are full of folds because I, for a long time, I didn't have a big studio and I just worked in a small um, railroad apartment that's only nine feet across. And so um, in order to make very large pieces, I would just fold them up as I went. And I'd add on and I'd fold them up. So this piece is 10 feet tall and 15 feet wide. And I just did it at my, it, at my kitchen table. There's the kitchen table. And then this, there's the kitchen table again. I, I do a lot of work at my kitchen table. You'll see this lamp in a lot of pictures, in all of these pictures. See, there it is in the middle. There it is in the, ba in the middle. There it is there. I, this, I just finished, this I just finished last week. And they, well, actually, and they're like these little Italian candies and these like New York City sort of um, violet candies that I love. And uh, so those appear sometimes. And that's how that started. And then there's the, then I, then I bought an acorn squash and you know, the rest just, the world just keeps, you know, feeding. And then this is something I've just started that I, I don't know if this is going to be any good or not, but this is just sort of the way it's progressing. It's a little weird. I, I haven't drawn faces in a long time. These are some works that I did in bed. This one is 10 feet square. They're, these are all pretty big. I want to get, oh, that's my studio. I think that would be fun to see. And that's the table. You know, I'm, as you can see, I'm, yeah, I'm not very neat. But um, let me race ahead. I want to get to those up to the pictures that are in the exhibition. Um, okay. So this isn't in the show, but I was, um, I was invited to um, do a piece in response to the choreography of the dancer Susan Rethorst. She is a, um, a, a choreographer and dancer from the 1970s who was a contemporary of uh, Trisha Brown, Yvonne Rayner, and Steve Paxton. And this piece is about, uh, oh, it's about nine feet tall and about 15 feet wide. And uh, she, Susan Rethorst choreographed her work in her domestic space, and then she would take all her living room furniture and bring it into the performance space, and it didn't become just props, but it actually sort of, they became sort of part of the dance in a way. And uh, so I thought, well, rather than, when they asked me to draw um, in response to Susan Rethorst, um, Melinda Ring, another choreographer, invited me to do that. Um, <coughs> I thought, Oh, I mean, they chose me because I do a lot of work at home, too. So um, I thought, you know, rather than draw the dancers, I think when Susan goes to rehearsal with her dancers in, in like some other space, I'll come into her apartment and I'll sort of become one of the dancers myself and draw the space. So this is a drawing of her living room. And then this back space here is the, is the space of St. Mark's Church, uh, the, the, uh, where it was performed, at dance space. And this is it being installed. 
And this is, the, this is actually Susan, uh, another response to Susan Redhorst's work. Um, she moved to Philadelphia and she said, hey Dawn, you want to do it again for Bryn Mawr? So I said, okay, I'm working in color now, so let's go. So, um, and this one is hanging um, in the Goodhart Theater at Bryn Mawr, um, in the fly space of the theater. And this is a collaboration I did with Mark Luthold. I did some drawing, he's a ceramic artist, I did some drawings, he made sculptures based on my drawings, I made drawings based on his sculptures, sort of multi-generational kind of thing, and so this is that progress. I'm going a little fast because these are kind of progress shots. And that's uh, how it gets built. This was basically a piece that I made do by doing a one drawing every day. <coughs> and that was how it was installed in the gallery, with the table of work of Marx. So finally, I'm sorry, I got, fi I got 50 seconds. And um, this is a place called Civitella Ranieri. It's um, in Umbria, just, it's in, a, in Umbria in a town called Umbertide, just outside of Perugia. And it's an artist residency, and I just thank God. It was so glorious. It was this past summer. This is it. Wow. And when I was there, I just thought, shoot, I don't know how I'm going to work here. I mean, I can make work, but it's going to be it's going to be pretty, you know. And I don't know, like, <laughs> I, I just don't know how I feel about that. It's like I don't know how to like how, how do you make be like how do you respond to like just beauty? And um, so I um, said, well, whatever. It, this is a tobacco drying shed that was my studio. And so, well, I, like this was like what they fed us, you know. So I thought, well, you know, I'm just gonna like respond. That's what I kind of do. I just respond to the world. And so this is my table. This is about, well, this is in the show, you know. And then uh, you can see it out there. I don't have to say much. So, and then there were these beautiful little um, chamomile flowers by the side of the road. And there, that's how the drawing started, just with some dumb little drawing of chamomile flowers um, that uh, just because I was there to work and it's like, you know, just start working. And every night before I went to bed, I'd do shadows of, on my wall. And then this is a, like a three-dimensional drawing of a cantaloupe in gouache. And the last thing that I'll show you is the grass piece. And this is, um, I found a little patch of grass. The funny thing is that I always loved Frangelico paint, Frangelico's paintings so much, and I especially loved his carpets of grass, of lawn, you know, that looked like they, they were so full of all different kinds of plants, and I thought, oh, he made that up. It's all symbolic, you know, all those flowers, and maybe that's true. But the lawns in Italy really do look like that. So I thought, shoot, there's this lawn right outside of my studio. So every morning for about an hour and a half, I'd sit out in front of my studio at the same time every day, and um, kind of like brushing my teeth. It was just like something I did every day. And I just started to do a painting of this little patch of grass that I had to mark off with, um, you know, with, with paper because I, otherwise I couldn't find my place. So this was the first day. And then I just did it over the course of about 25 days. And so this is, these, this is a series of photographs that will show you the progress of the painting of the piece. That's it. Thank you so much. Um, should I take a few questions? Yeah. Okay. You tell me. Tell me when to stop. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> you can talk. Anybody? That's true because I, I do 
I do freeze frame now. You know, I mean, back in the Back in the earlier days, I used to do it in real time, and so I, I missed a lot, you know? And, um, and so it really was a, about that passage of time in a way, and uh, there were fragments of figures and, and spaces, but of course with the freeze frame, you know, it really does freeze it. And you're absolutely right, and that's, it's a great question, and um, I think I still feel a very strong connection with the light of the screen, and that remains important to me. Uh, somehow, it's important to me because I'm, it, I don't, know, I don't know how to explain it, except I feel like I'm there, you know? The funny thing about being at Brown and taking movies, I think, I, I, I don't know if I mentioned this last night, but um, at dinner, but when I was, uh, there was this class, I, I think Marianne Doan taught it. I, I wasn't taking the, the, this particular class, but you know, you could sit in on screenings and I, and she was, I don't know if this was the title of the course, but it was kind of maternal melodrama, you know? And uh, they were showing um, Barbara Stanwyck in Stella Dallas. And uh, I remember the whole room was full of women. And, and, you know, really tough, you know, feminist, you know, like really great keep critical distance kind of people. And I counted myself among them, you know? And uh, so I remember sitting in the front row and I was like watching it and staying tough. And then at the end of the movie, you know, it's like I was just like, drowning in tears. And, uh, I, I, and I, I, I remember like the credits started roll and I always sit through the credits but it's like I gotta get out of here because I can't let anybody see this. And, uh, and it, but I, that, um, those two things are really important in my life. You know, that it's both uh, that I'm able to um, have a critical distance, you know, and I can sort of read things and analyze things but it's also important to me that I'm also kind of a fan and that I am immersed in the fiction. You know? So, <laughs> did I answer everything? <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, I... Uh, I'm interested in, in, uh, in a lot of those pieces, how interested you are in rooms and architecture and spaces. Um, like, for example, you could draw somebody's whole bookshelf you could draw a whole bookshelf of books and, and reveal as much about that space or about that person that's in that space or even about that movie as drawing all those rooms and staircases and all that kind of thing. So, so the choices you make about what to draw I think are really interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Hmm. When it comes to the movies, um, I could just be, I'll just be watching movies and then sometimes it, it'll say, wow, I can see that whole house, you know? <laughs> um, and so that will, because I'm oftentimes looking past the figures and uh, uh, even when I'm deeply entrenched. Um, and uh, so like when I was watching My Reputation, it's like, wow, that room is, it's not just that the room was great, it was, it was that the camera went in some pretty interesting places and shared a lot with me as a viewer. It was very generous, you know. So um, that's kind of how I pick things, you know. And, um, and but the, wor the, the things that I choose to draw from my own life, um, I'm actually one that doesn't really set up still lives. One time I was invited to be in a show and it was a still life show and I, I was going to make them something new, and I started arranging things on my kitchen table. It's like, okay, I'll give them a kitchen table drawing, and it just, like, I couldn't figure it out. And then I had dinner, and I went away, and I went shopping, and I came back, and there was this stuff on my table, and I was like, okay, that's it. So, anyway. Um, but there's also a difference between, yeah, the, the movies and the, and the working from life that I started to get at is that you know, uh, a photograph gives you a limited amount of information. Great information, but very limited. You know? And, uh, but for instance, if that, if I can't see into a black shadow over there, then I can just walk right up to it and, uh, and look into it, you know? And so I can, I have more choices about how much information I can include when I work from my own life in a way. Um, you know, that's something that I always loved about Salvador Dali's um, paintings of there are these two paintings he did of baskets of bread. And I always thought them very strange because it's like, they're just paintings of baskets of bread. How is that surreal? And yet they still feel like very hyper real, you know? And I thought, what is it about them? And then I thought, well, it's that the, bread, the basket of bread is over here, you know? And, uh, and we, we, can, we feel like, like it's not in front of us, it's like over there. I mean, just in terms of its perspective in the, in the, um, in the, in the field of the painting. But it's, 
attention to surface detail is so heightened that it feels like it's here, you know? And so there's something that just doesn't compute. It's too real for, the, for its distance, you know? And I, um, so I, I'm interested in that. <laughs> I think I've got to go. <laughs>